It's good to see all of you this morning. I know you're really here for the hot dogs, but I'm glad you're going to humor me for a little while. <laughs> I wanted to welcome our guest musician, Shelly, this morning. Yay, Shelly. Thank you. I'm still learning names, so bear with me. Getting there. Getting there. Um, Welcome to this time of worship, this time of centering ourselves to find spiritual nourishment in a busy world, a time to refresh and renew our relationships to one another and with God. Let us hear our welcoming statement. <laughs> Come on, bud. <laughs> Volunteer. I was just tipping. That wasn't falling. There's a big difference. <laughs> Is it my guy? Guy? It will be. <laughs> Welcome to Old South Church, United Church of Christ. Welcome to believers, to questioners, and to questioning believers. We gather in the hope of creating a safe space where you are free to risk being your authentic self. No matter how you identify or express your race, gender, or sexuality, you are welcome here. For this is God's house, and God welcomes all ages, colors, cultures, gifts, and abilities. Your presence here is a gift that challenges us to open our doors as wide as God's welcome. No matter where you are, or where you are on life's, no matter who you are, or where you are on life's journey, you are welcomed here by a God who made you and loves you just the way you are, and loves you enough to challenge you to keep growing toward that person that God made you to be, that together we may choose love and seek justice for all. Let us take a moment to center ourselves for this time together. God of light and love, surround us with your presence. Bring us the inner peace we long for. Guide us to a quiet place where we can hear your still speaking message of love and hope. Help us to release those things from yesterday and to not yet focus on the things of tomorrow. But for just this short time, let us be here with you. Amen. 
So the background on the reading is a little bit longer today, but I think, I think it's okay. I think you'll stay with me. Um, so the passage today is from the book of John. This gospel is different from the other three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are called the synoptic gospels. Generally speaking, the synoptics tell us what Jesus said and did, and John tells us who Jesus is. The synoptics focus on the stories and sayings of Jesus, and John emphasizes the identity of Jesus as the Christ. There are only eight miracles in the book of John, six of which are not found in the other Gospels. Contrast that with Mark, who we talked about a few weeks ago, which details about 20 miracles and mentions another 10. John uses metaphors to describe Jesus, like the bread of life, living water, light of the world, good shepherd, and true vine. Over one third of his gospel is focused on the last week of Jesus' life. In fact, 90% of his gospel is not found in the other gospels. The writer of John is writing at about 90 AD, believed and he believes so strongly that the new Christian movement, in the movement, that he wanted to write a gospel that would be the essential truth and put it in the best possible manner for the time. A time when Christianity was under attack from several different quarters, including Jews, Romans, skeptics, and others, making charges against it. The author was aware of the ways the first three Gospels were being attacked and criticized, and he wanted, he wanted to use this new writing to counter those arguments against this new faith. His hope was that he might write a Gospel that was not only true, but that offered a presentation of the Christian faith that would overcome the objections of its critics and gain the respect of the educated and the cultured people of his day. This is the story, is the story of, of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with the disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus, saw, looked, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread to, for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. This is a boy, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far can they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaf, gave them thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, but nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled the 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over for those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, uh, they set, began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Here ends the scripture reading. So the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, a story most of us have heard since childhood, 
and the only miracle of Jesus that's recorded in all four Gospels. It must be important. For the author of the book of John, the amount of the physical food that came into existence was not as important as the spiritual food that, was, that we can sustain through Jesus. The story focuses on Jesus' wisdom, power, and the influence he had over the crowd. 5,000 men. So that means there's probably 10,000, right? Because there's probably some women and kids around as well. <laughs> the, wisdom, uh, the wisdom is shown in the story by Jesus knowing how he's going to solve the problem before the disciples do. His power is demonstrated to the people by his previous acts of healing and then by being able to feed them. And then they declare this prophet who has come to us, to the earth. The Gospel of John, as previously stated, was written for those who did not accept Jesus as the bread of life, the Messiah, the Christ. In the first century, they were still arguing about it at that point. Therefore, the story of the great crowd and being fed by the bread and the fish was an important one for John to retell and to focus on. The author wanted to remind those listening to him that those who did receive Jesus would be nurtured and that they would have their lives sustained by him in the often hostile world in which they lived. But this challenged me to consider in what ways does God nurture us in the world today? What spiritual bread is available to us? And how often do we participate in that opportunity to be fed? But before we go there, let me talk about the word God for a moment. Using the word God is only one of hundreds of ways to refer to the divine. The power of creation, the guide, the energy of love, the spirit of compassion, there, I already named five. I believe the word God prevents some people from understanding the divine. Because the word God for many evokes an image of something far away. Punishing, judging, or controlling. Often the word God gets people thinking about what God might be like instead of experiencing God. Thinking about God and knowing God are two very different things. I remember long ago I was watching an interview with Carl Jung, and the interviewer said, do you believe in God? He said, no, I know God. If you try to understand the biblical stories from a scientific mind, you become an unbeliever. But if you understand the biblical stories from your heart, they make a whole lot more sense. When I work with children and talk about God, I explain that lots of people think about God, talk about God, write about God, argue about God. And all those things, thinking, talking, writing, and arguing are things you do in your head. The thing is, God is more like a feeling, like love or joy or peace, or friendship, or comfort, or security. God is a feeling. That's the title of my first children's book that may come out in the next five years. <laughs> and lots of notes. <laughs> now, if you only try to think about God and haven't ever felt God, you may be feeling a little confused this morning. In my work in hospice, I, one of the questions I would often ask folks was, have you ever felt God. This was especially helpful for people who were having fear, anxiety near the end of their life. And sadly, the answer was too often no. They had spent their whole life believing in a thought and had never experienced God. Feeling God brings a comfort and peacefulness that thinking about God can never do. 
nourish on our spirits is not done in our head. And I'm fairly certain our stomachs are closer to where God lives than our heads. So talking about being fed with bread and fresh brings a strong image of God being a comfort in our gut, not our head. You know that gut feeling sometimes when you feel moved to do something that is out of the ordinary for you. I think that's usually the divine inspiring us and moving us. If my gut tells me to do something, I've learned to do it, unless it's expensive. Then I do use my brain a little bit. <laughs> but if my gut tells me to call someone or email, I do it. If my gut takes me to take a job, I do it. If we lived following our head and letting our heart lead our brain, if we live by following our heart and letting our heart lead our brain instead of putting our brain first, I think we would be happier people and have a happier world. Wars are usually about thoughts because a heart that knows God cannot start a war. Fed by divine spirit, loving energy, God for short. And the three questions, is what, in what ways does God nurture us in the world today? What spiritual bread is available to us? And how often do we participate in that opportunity to be fed? It seems to many that God isn't as active in today's world. We don't have nearly as many miracles. Not too many folks have heard God talk from a bush. So where is God anyway? The thing is, if God, that God is often quiet and the world is very noisy. If God did talk to us from a bush, we would probably think there's something wrong with our smartphone. <laughs> Most often, God nurtures us in quiet moments. That is why so many people say that they know God in nature. Because in nature, they don't think about God. They experience God. So many people say that they know God in music. Why is that? Because in music, you don't think about God, you experience God. Artists, dancers, quilters, especially when working alone, let go of thoughts and experience a calm that is the place that God can be found. So one way that God nurtures us today is in quiet and creative moments. We can seek out spiritual moments alone, but being uh, fed by God in community also works. The energy of community gathered for worship. The call from a friend at just the right moment when you needed to hear from somebody you love. Sometimes a seemingly innocent encounter that we later realize is the touch of the divine. That leads me to my last question. How often do we make ourselves available to God to be fed? Many say that God surrounds us and is also within us. Yet we hunger for God. How is that possible? How can God be so available to us and yet we can't seem to find God? Usually because we're not paying attention. We let our lives and our minds get very busy. Maybe with work or family with worries or grief or anger. We are really good at keeping our minds busy. But where can we find God? Down, down here somewhere, between here and here is pretty much where God is. Sometimes when I lead a prayer, I will start with gather yourself into a place of prayer. Wherever in your body you feel most at peace, that's your place of prayer. So how can we add more feeling God into our lives? By slowing down. By slowing down our brains. How about allowing time each day to just sit and look at a tree? 
for the less artistic but curious, get a coloring book. Or go on a hunt for the perfect rock. Or quilt. Or contemplate the colors you see. Yes, there are bigger things we can do. But just begin with 10 minutes a day of shutting down your brain. It's a good start. Anything that takes us out of our heads for a few minutes is a chance for God to sneak in. Because God is waiting for that momentary opening. And once the connection is made, it gets easier. You notice the, the divine energy in more and more places. And there will be times when you get busy again and forget to shut down your brain a few minutes a day. You may notice that inner hunger for God again. Go back. Start over. We must learn to relax our minds to find God, which is not something we're taught very often in our culture. One of my favorite authors is Joyce Rupp, a Catholic nun and spiritual guide to many. And in her book, Fresh Bread, she states, giving oneself to the process of reflection is that moment, minute, or hour in which we pause inwardly and ponder the message that lies deeper than what is seen, heard, tasted, touched, or smelled. Reflection is an attunement of the imaginative and the intuitive parts of our inner being. It is developed by using regular spaces in the day to deliberately pause, to think about what is before us. We come to see these reflective times believing that God dwells within and that these times are meant to free us to be receptive and responsive to this loving presence. The inner hunger for God is everywhere. People fill themselves with so many things but neglect that quiet energy, that quiet divine energy of peace and love. Look at the world around us. There's a great need for spiritual connection to the divine. People are searching. More and more people say they are spiritual but not religious. Yet churches are sinking. Why? Maybe churches need to be more spiritual. Just thinking. <laughs> Placing social involvement, pa balancing social involvement with community care and the spiritual nourishment is the well-rounded church. To be religious should mean we are also spiritual. Sadly, too many churches forget this leg of the stool and it tips over. Jesus gave us many examples of withdrawing. As a matter of fact, immediately after this story, he goes to be alone. You can call it contemplation, reflection, meditation, whatever you want. I just know we need it. After Jesus dealt with the crowd of 5,000 and following him, I am sure he needed some time alone. The 5,000 plus gathered came to be fed spiritually. They were hungry for the wisdom that Jesus was preaching. And then they got physically hungry too. And Jesus met both of those needs. So we started with those questions. In what ways does God nurture us in the world today? What spiritual bread is available to us? And how often do we participate in that opportunity to be fed? God offers nourishment in the quiet moments when we slow down and let God into our hearts. God is always available. We just need to pay attention to the many ways God is still speaking. The phrase from Psalm 46 that is so well known for a good reason, be still and know that I am God. Let us be a church that helps others to feel supported and affirmed, a place where they can find spiritual support, loving energy, divine goodness, creative joy, in short, God. Let it be so. Amen.
But we're going to do it later. <laughs> Have a seat, folks. Um, we come to a time of sharing our joys and our concerns. So please feel free to wave at Superman this morning. If you have a mask, would you put it on for his sake? Thank you. Yesterday was Cindy Grassley's birthday. <gasps> so, happy birthday. Happy birthday. like prayers for uh, Harry Kegler, who is in the CCU unit at Hillcrest Hospital. Um, for those of you that know him, um, you might keep him in your prayers. Thank you. I have a colleague in ministry who is ending his interim ministry at Western Reserve Christian Church today and next week begins uh, an interim ministry at uh, the Congregational Church in Dover, UCC. So he's uh, just prayers for his ministry and things that are going on. Amen. Um, a welcome uh, to Pastor Wally, who's sitting back there, uh, waving. <laughs> welcome, Pastor Wally. For those of you who don't know, he was our interim minister uh, about seven, eight years ago. Um, so welcome. Glad I didn't know that before I preached. <laughs> Okay, we're good. Thank you. Let us gather those things which were shared aloud and those things that we have kept in silence. Let us gather our hearts and minds into a quiet place. Let us be together in a time of holy stillness. Eternal God, we pray that you will help us to center ourselves as we pray. Take our minds from all that would distract us. Take from us our fears. Take from us our apprehension about our tomorrows. Take from us our resentments and our angers. Take away from us all that is negative and destructive Instead, may we be bathed by your love, which will not let us go. We offer you gratitude for your many mercies bestowed upon us so generously. You lend us life, and you lend us each day, many of which we take for granted. Help us to affirm and use and appreciate each day as your gift to us. You provide so generously for us, we thank you that we live in a land which has been so blessed with abundance. We have the opportunity for a quality of life and an abundance of goods which is unequaled. Help us to count our blessings and always to give you thanks. When Jesus bid his disciples to feed the people gathered around him, he had compassion. When he came to his friends in the storm, he calmed their fears. We thank you that you care about food and fear, two of humankind's enduring concerns. Feed us and calm our fears as we journey from day to day. Give us trust that you walk with us. We lift to you all those who are hurting physically spiritually, mentally, financially. Bring them 
your peace and the power into it to endure. We pray all this in Jesus' name, who taught us to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing our other hymn. And anyone who doesn't have their communion packet, wave your hand so um, these guys here can deliver. She's got them. Did everybody get their little cup? You no. <laughs> if it bothers you, go ahead inside. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> It's just water. If you need to turn something off, do you need to turn that off? Do we need to turn off the music? Okay, let's turn the music off. <laughs> 